Welcome to the Bully Pulpit Show. I'm Mark Joseph. Thanks for joining us for another episode. Our guest today is the Vice President of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, Paul Crouch Jr. Paul, thanks for joining us today. Hey Mark, how are you? Good. Your friends know you as PJ. That's correct. But everybody else knows you as Paul Jr. That's correct. So, what should I call you today? PJ works. Okay, PJ. It works fine for me. Well, thanks for joining us. Listen, you run one of the largest networks in the world. Uh, what is that like on a day-to-day -day basis? What are your responsibilities? Well, you know, you got two sides to it. You have the ministry side, and, the, and then you have the business side. So, and in, with most ministries, you know, if you've worked in a church or any other organization like that, you know, in any given day, you wear about 16 different hats. You know, so I, I when I come in. I'm answering emails, I'm, I'm dealing with staff issues, I'm working in production. I come from a technical background, so I can be consulting on lighting or cameras or new equipment. And then at the end of the day, I can actually be on camera hosting a program. And, uh, and then at the after that, I could be, you know, cleaning the toilets. It, it really doesn't matter. In a ministry and in TBN, you do everything. Now, I happen to know that you guys have had lots of offers for your network from Money Guys in New York and oh, elsewhere. Yeah. You've had billions of dollars offered, offered to you if you would just give up the network and let it become sort of the home shopping channel or whatever. Right. What is that like? I mean, how do you kind of resist that temptation well, to do be that? Well, because, you know, television was founded as a revenue creation model. You know, I mean, television is nothing but the ability to capture eyeballs so you can sell commercials. That's all television was created for. It's a money-making machine. But TBN is not. I mean, obviously we have to have money to pay our bills. We have light bills. We have cameras just like you guys. But TBN's purpose and my, the, what was in the heart of my father when he really started TBN in 1973 was it's about ministry. There's a scripture in the Bible, and you've read it many times, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that's what TBN was founded for. That's why it exists today. So dad took that scripture literally, started with one little TV station here in Los Angeles in a studio not much bigger than this, a little converted warehouse. And ac actually 34 years later, we are sitting on 34 full power TV stations across the United States, 12 1,500 cable outlets around the world, and TBN is beaming the gospel on 67 satellites that go direct to home. Literally, right now, except for Antarctica, there's no place on the planet that you could not somehow tune into TBN. And that's what it's all about, going to all the world and preach the gospel. So how do you put a value on that? They can offer us a billion, they could offer us 10 billion. Trust me. TBN isn't for sale. Hmm. Now, we've talked about this before, but you have registered or gotten Nielsen ratings fairly recently. Mm -hmm. Before that, you kind of relied on letters from people, anecdotal evidence of viewership. What was that transition like, and what have you learned since you instituted those ratings? Well, ratings are important because it tells you, again, how many eyeballs are watching. And our, our, our kind of thermometer before was, like you said, was like viewer response or letters or emails. But what we really start to, started to learn after we got Nielsen ratings is a lot of the, the let's say the medically based shows that teach you about health and nutrition garnered a lot of letters and emails because people had questions on you know cholesterol and weight and diet and that kind of thing. But it didn't necessarily garner the greatest eyeball response or the amount of people that were watching. And, and what we found is that movies or documentaries or things that talked about the, the Lord or a movie about uh, the Ten Commandments or something garnered huge ratings but didn't necessarily garner a lot of letter response. So you kind of have to take the two and, and balance the, the information out. But again, the, the bottom line of TBN, we could have turned TBN into the Christian Home Shopping Network a long time ago and made way more money. If money was the focus of TBN, we could be selling nativity stones and rings and trinkets and this and that. And it's really not. It's about touching and affecting people's lives. You know, my dad has said this many, many times. You may not need TBN now. If, if, if you've got a job, if the kids are healthy, life's going good, you may not want to watch or need TBN. 
but there is going to be a time in your life a crisis is going to hit. You're going to lose a loved one. You're going to need answers to why. Why am I here? Something like that eventually is going to hit you. It may be in your teens. It may be when you're 80 years old. But eventually you're going to need us. And we've been there 24-7 for over 34 years. And eventually you will tune into TBN. Now, what was it like growing up? Paul Crouch Jr. When did your parents start this adventure and how did it affect your <laughs> life as a kid and you kind of grew up on TV or behind the scenes? Well, anyway. grew up behind the scenes for sure. Again, TBN started in 1973. I was literally 13, 14 years old and I, 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 even before that my father worked with the Assemblies of God in their film department so my earliest memories as a kid were lights and cameras and these big dollies and things that I didn't quite understand, but when I was 13, 14, mom and dad started TBN, like I said, in a very small little studio, much like this. And I, at that point, God really got a hold of my heart, and, and I saw the future. I saw the power of the technology. I saw that, you know, somebody could go on camera and pray, and people would call in and, and get saved. And it was just like, wow, light bulbs, really went on for me and at that point you know I, I really dedicated my life to not only learning the technology because I was like you know kind of a techno geek anyway so I really enjoyed the technical side and the lighting and the audio and, and the cables and all the stuff that it took place so that captured me fascinated me but then as I've gotten older I'm learning more about the ministry side of it and the content side and what it takes to really touch and affect people's lives. You know, Joel Osteen has been all over the media in the last couple of years, a guy who was behind the scenes mm -hmm. and had to step up. You've kind of begun to make that transition, being more on camera. What is that like? Are you, did you hesitate at first? Very much so. In fact, if you'd have told me three, four years ago I was going to be on camera almost daily, I would have said, you're nuts. There's no way. Now, and Joel and, Joel and I do have very similar backgrounds. He was his dad's director. I directed at TBN for many years. I did camera. I did different things. But his transition was a little more dramatic because his father was well one week, passed away, and Joel's in the pulpit the next week. It was literally that fast a transition for Joel. In my case, certainly my mom and dad are not getting any younger. My dad's in his 70s now and very much starting to slow down. But there's been a good five to seven year transition now with him slowing down, me picking up the pieces, picking up the, certainly and, and initially the administrative side and knowing how TBN functions with our payroll and the stations and the managers and knowing the people and the personnel. And then again, but what's more important, quite honestly, is learning really the spiritual side of what it takes to run a ministry and the prayer that it takes on a daily basis to stay covered and protected and to know what to do and how to do the right thing. And that's what's been transitioning in the last seven years. And as my dad, you know, most warriors for the Lord will never retire. You know, many of these guys just, they, they don't retire. They just, like Joel's father, like John Osteen, you, they just preach and they go with their boots on, so to speak. And I think my folks will be the same way. They'll never retire. They love working for the Lord. And when they get called home to, to go to glory, so be it. But the next generation is now in place at TBN. And TBN, I truly don't believe, will miss a beat. And talk a bit about your show. You're on almost every day. Uh, what is that show about? Well, it's called Behind the Scenes. And it's actually the first program my father started 34 years ago. You know, back in those days, we didn't even have videotape machines. It was one or two cameras at the most piped right through a little bang box switcher going to a microwave right to the transmitter. And so dad started this little daily program called Behind the Scenes. And it's, it's really like a, a report to our board of directors. Our board of directors at TBN, we're a nonprofit corporation, are your donors, your supporters, those that love and support TBN on a daily basis are what keep us alive, so we report to them daily. Here's what we're doing. Here's what new programs we're doing. Here's what uh, new stations we've bought. Here's a new transmitter that we're getting. Here's a new truck we purchased. So Dad 
used it as, as a report to our supporters and our givers, but more importantly, it's a time to let the people that watch TBN know what the results are. You know, we can sit there and beam wonderful programming out, but if nobody's watching it, number one, and we're not touching and affecting people's lives, it's ridiculous. Why even do it? And so that's what behind the scenes is. And like I said, as Dad has started to slow down, I've kind of picked up the slack and gone on camera. And I obviously have my own style and things I like to do and different things that, that he didn't do. I like to have a lot of guests. You know, Dad, it was, for many years, it was just him and a coffee table and a bunch of letters, and he'd just read letters. For me, I'm a little bit different. I'm a little more ADD than I think my father was, so I enjoy having you know, guests and different segments, and I do different roll-ins and man-on-the-street things, so I try to break it up a little bit, but that's really what behind the scenes is. Okay. We'll be back in just a moment with Paul Crouch, Jr. Back with Paul Crouch Jr. continue our conversation. Your parents have weathered a lot of attacks mm -hmm. over the years. Uh, they've survived. A lot of uh, people are not standing. What has that been like to watch your parents sort of uh, attacked in the public eye and the, in the press? Well, it, it is hard. And, you know, any time a family member, whether it be a child or your parents or a cousin or anybody, a loved one, it, it's tough. But, you know, the Bible has a lot of instruction and scripture on rejoicing in your persecution. You know, Christ himself was persecuted horribly. In fact, so persecuted they nailed him on a tree and, and killed him for it. So it's, it's hard, but I think if you've been in ministry for any length of period or, or any period of time, you know, the, you know the world and the secular media is gonna attack you. I think what really hurts them more is when so-called brothers in Christ attack them or say their theology is this or this and you know and if Christians would ever just get together it, it, would, it would revolutionize our faith but, but I don't know that that's ever even going to be possible so you, you have to develop a thick skin they like I said and like you know we've talked about they've been around for 34 years so their skin right now is about uh, the thickness of a rhinoceros, and they just they, they just go forward. And again, you keep your eye on uh, the eye on the prize. You don't worry about what people say because you know people are going to claw out claw at, at you for you know jealousy reasons or different things or again theology or eschatology. It's just it's endless what people will kind of talk about and deal with. But but they truly have been faithful. But they're the first ones to admit that they've not been perfect, and, and neither am I. None of us are perfect, but they really do have a heart for ministry. They do have a heart for the Lord because they could have sold this network like we talked about earlier. If it were all about the money, they could be billionaires, but they turned that down and just said, no, it's not about the money. It's about ministry, and, and, but it still is hard as a son to see people say, unkind things, but I, I really am already bracing myself that I'm next. You know, as they pass on and the torch is passed to the next generation, I, I, I'm ready. But have there been moments where as a son, you're watching them on TV and going, oh, you know, all kids kind of have that parental gap sometimes. Yeah, a little bit, but, but I've seen them privately. I see them behind the scenes and I know where their heart is. I know what motivates them. And it's not what people see on TV. It really is not. The persona and perception is very different. So, again, am I my parents? Absolutely not. Do I have my own ideas on programming and what I like to see and how we should do things? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
But again, we want to keep our eye on the prize. And there's a hurting, dying world out there that, in our opinion, needs Christ. Our friend Phil Cook has a blog, and I notice you pop in there sometimes. <laughs> it seems to me that you are a little bit more aware of what people are saying and the criticism, and you respond to it, you take it into account. Am I, am I correct in that? I, I'm probably a little more media savvy than my folks, and I know how to go on the internet and blog and search and look up stuff. So the answer is yes. And I will defend and pine for a fight if I really, something really gets me going and, and I really disagree with something somebody says, even though, you know, it may be uh, something kind of ridiculous. You know, I'll get in there and, and, and throw a few punches once in a while, but, but you win more through love than you th do through, you know, through confrontation. And, and Christ taught that, and that's what, I, you know, love those that persecute you is what the Bible says, and that's what, what we try to do. But when I saw you responding, it, I, I think it gave those people a sense like you were actually listening to their opinions and taking them into account. And Absolutely, a and that's many times, you know, if somebody sends a negative letter, that's all they want is recognition. Mm -hmm. And you'll say, you know what, you're right. That we'll, we'll take that into account next time. They turn around and they go, wow, you know what? And then they'll tell you all the good things that you're doing. But it's always... You know, the bad, they, uh, so many Christians and people in general, I think it's just human nature, I don't think it's just Christians, you know, want to throw the negative out first. And then if you acknowledge them, then they will say, well, you know what, I guess you guys are kind of okay. Mm. So, whatever. Well, as a self proclaimed techno geek, <laughs> uh, what's coming down the road? I mean, the internet is converging. We're here on an IPTV channel. How, what kind of changes are you anticipating, getting ready for, and what do you see happening? Well, and that's one of the things I really do keep, keep my pulse on and my finger on the pulse is new technology, new ways to propagate the gospel. Because again, for us, it's not selling things. It's not wanting to you know, have the latest mousetrap. It's, it's the propagation of the message. But there's new ways and, and neat ways to do that. So we're looking at the internet has been a huge part of our, our uh, plans really for the last seven years. We've been streaming video and doing, the first streaming we did at TBN was about eight pixels and a picture the size of a postage stamp up in the corner of your computer. Now it's getting almost to DVD quality, you know, if you have the right encoders and different things. So the internet is going to be huge. We are looking headlong into podcasting. You can now go to iTunes and download behind the scenes and the praise program and some of our youth programs on podcasting. So, you know, you can watch TBN when you want to watch TBN. We're, we have an archive area on our website. If you go to www.tbn.org is our website. There's an archive area where you can watch praise and behind the scenes anytime, 24-7. But then on the broadcast side, now that's kind of the the, the, the low stream quality of the business, you know, as far as what we're trying to do. On the broadcast side, we're going the opposite direction in better quality, higher quality, because we're in the conversion now to what's called high definition television. And many of, you know, your audience may remember, although you probably have a younger audience in the 50s, and I remember it, you, we went from black and white to color. And once you went to color, trust me, once you got the color cameras and the color TV sets and the color transmitters, nobody went back to black and white. But that transition, as you know, took 10, 15 years before it was finally complete. We're, na we're now in the next, I don't call it really a revolution, I just call it an evolution. We're in the next evolution of television, which is standard definition to high definition. You're starting to see it now in all the stores and Sports is benefiting from it tremendously. Movies in high definition are very cool. So we are now starting the conversion of many of our studios, and we've got 34 of them. So we've got quite a, quite a thing to, to tackle, but we're going from standard definition to high definition. And our main studio here in Costa Mesa is our first studio to be converted, and we're building a new studio in Manhattan in New York City right now and that'll be our second studio to go high definition. Sounds expensive. It is expensive, but we're, we're in that delta curve now where if you're building a new studio from scratch, high definition gear is almost the same price as standard def. You know, it's like in the electronics and com computer world, every six months everything gets twice as fast and 
50% the price. And high definition ha has been ex extremely expensive. I saw high definition demonstrated in 1986 with the first NAB show, broadcasters convention I went to in Vegas, 86, that was 20 plus years ago. And I saw it demonstrated then, and it's taken though 20 years to get that technology into the manufacturer's hands and got getting it to a price point where now we can afford it. And for us, it's within our price point and we are starting the conversion. So will networks as we know them go away? Will, will it just go straight to the, to the internet? I think the internet's gonna have a huge impact on the way people watch TV. It already, already has. Look at YouTube, look at MySpace, look at what is, is out there right now. In fact, there are videos on YouTube that get more eyeballs than NBC. But what's happening is, is content is becoming king and distribution is becoming less important. Distribution's getting cheaper. So if you have good content and you have a great show or you have a great skateboarding video or you, catch, you caught something unbelievable on video, you can now get that into a distribution medium that's inexpensive and that everybody can see. And so that's something that's gonna have a huge effect on the way people watch TV. But I don't see broadcasters or traditional broadcasting going away anytime soon, at least I hope not. Okay, we'll come back in just a moment with more with Paul Crouch Jr. Stay tuned. back with Paul Crouch Jr. And Paul, I wanted to ask you about the future of the network. I mean, if you're t playing an increasingly large role there, mm -hmm. where, where do you want to ch take it and what changes do you see uh, happening in the future? Well, the last five to seven years, you know, we really have tried to focus more on content. Like I said earlier, content is king. The first 25 years of TBN, it was all about distribution. It was all about buying TV stations, buying transmitters, buying studios, buying trucks. It was the hardware side. Christians, for some reason, love to give to hardware. They want to put their name on a plaque and stick it on a pew. That's how churches have been funded for the last 150 years. Software, though, is something that's a little harder to raise money for, but increasingly TBN has diverted more of our budget to movies, to documentaries, to the content side because like I said, distribution is getting cheaper and cheaper. On, so so we, we've got to keep staying relevant with, with the programming, with the way we do it, the production techniques. You know, you can't, I really don't believe, just go put three cameras in a church anymore, shoot a guy behind a pulpit, and get a, garner a great audience because we're in the 500 channel universe and everybody, including myself, has ADD and they have a remote control with their thumb on it, and it's like, okay, this is boring, click, let's go to something else. So we have to be aware of that. On the, on the hardware side, though, TBN is still, even though we have 34 full-power TV stations, we're still looking at newer markets. We've just added TV stations within the last couple of years in Philadelphia, Virginia Beach, and Orlando. And we're gonna talk about Orlando in a second, but we are also looking, uh, broadcast licenses are becoming available. We just found one in, Col or in Denver, and we've not had a full power license in Denver. We're looking at that. We're looking at San Francisco. We're looking at Detroit and Chicago. So there still are some opportunities to buy full power broadcast licenses in these markets, although 
it's interesting, like I said, the whole model of broadcasting is changing and the way people t watch TV is changing. You know, people watching TV over the air with the old rabbit ears has declined to about 15 to 18 percent of the market. People are either watching on satellite, direct TV dish, cable, or the internet, like you guys. So it's, it is changing, but these broadcast licenses still do have value because when you own a full power broadcast license, like here, like we do in LA, there's a law called must carry. And that means all of the cable systems in the LA area must carry TBN. So that's, a, that, that's really where the value of a lot of these licenses are. So we're gonna expand into newer cities with these broadcast licenses with different things. And we're gonna continue to do new movies, new documentaries and make the content better and better. I've noticed, for instance, the difference in new sets that you guys have built. Mm -hmm. They're much more, I would say, down to earth, a little more, looks like Larry King Alive, actually. <laughs> um, have you had a hand in that, and is that part of the direction that you see it going? I do. You know, again, te television is a visual medium. It's all about visual. And again, as people are flipping, you want to give them something that will kind of capture them and say, wait, what, what is that? It's something attractive. And hopefully, if they'll stop long enough, whoever's on camera will say something compelling enough to get somebody to listen, whether that be myself or any of the other myriad of guests and, and people that we have on TBN. So, yeah, I mean, we, we want to be contemporary. We don't want people just flipping by and automatically looking and going, oh, that must be the Christian channel because that set is ugly or it's a shower curtain or it's got a plastic plant like this on the set or something <laughs> like that. You know, we want to try to do something a little more contemporary and something that will capture an audience because we're competing for the eyeballs of the world just like everybody else. And the telephone number, for instance, I noticed that it's kind of shrunk in size. Is that, is that part of what you're talking about? No, not necessarily. I mean, the, the nice thing about that is technology and digital technology has gotten to the point where you can start to use the lower bottom part of the screen and that people still see it. There was always a thing for many years called safe title where you had to move your graphics up almost, you know, right here before it'd see it because TV sets were manufactured in such a way that you never knew what the edge was really going to be. So it's really a technology thing and not really being intrusive on the visual that's on the screen, but that 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 phone number has been literally up for 34 years and on the other side everybody always criticizes and said oh you just you're wanting money you want people to give you donations or something that's why you put it up there and for telethon absolutely for two TBN's financial model again is very different we don't sell commercials we don't sell books we don't shove Kleenex and Chevrolet down your throat two weeks a year we held a telethon and uh, we go on camera and say, if you love and support this ministry and you want TBN to continue, give. Like PBS does. PBS, very, it's an identical model. And fortunately, like I said, for the last 34 years, uh, with through God's grace and, and everything else, they have. And that phone number certainly is a focus for donations during our telethons. But again, that's two weeks out of 52 in a given year. The rest of the time, it truly is a prayer and a connection line that, you know what, if, you're, if your child's sick, if you have just lost a loved one, if you really are hurting, call the number and there will be somebody on the other end of that line to talk to you, to pray with you, to help you, to get you. We've had, over the many years, it's now in the thousands that have called that phone number We've had suicides averted. We've had people call in, you know, for prayer. People, uh, it, it's amazing the reports that come in on a daily basis through Who that phone Who are line. these operators, by the way? They're just, you know what, they're God's people. It's the body of Christ on the other end of that line. These are church people? Church, all church, well, mostly church people. Uh, most of them are volunteers that come in and, and they treat it as a ministry. It's, you know, the, the, being a Christian is about, and Christ commands us to share our faith. And it's an opportunity for them to reach out. And many of these people are calling in at the most desperate times of their lives. 
You know, they may be in a bar, they may be absolutely have hit rock bottom in life and don't know where to turn. And we've got millions of calls that have come into that phone line and millions of lives that have been touched and changed because we were there. Hmm. How do you keep your faith vibrant? You've been behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen the foibles of lots of uh, ministers, public TV people. Sure. How do you keep from becoming cynical? Well, it's very simple for me. And again, you're right. I've seen it all, heard it all. And, and you know, for some people that does affect and, and, and stagger their faith. But I have always been and had the ability to keep my eyes on the Lord. Man will fail us every time. I will fail. You will fail. Ministers fail. They fail and fall all the time. Christ is the only one who's perfect. And I keep my eye on the prize, keep my, my eyes and my faith on the Lord. And I know for a fact I've got thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that pray for me daily. And, and I feel those prayers and that's what keeps me going. And do you consider yourself a minister, or a broadcaster, hmm. what? I consider myself just a willing vessel. Whatever the Lord calls me to do, like I said, whether it's change the gel on that light right there, go on camera, give the sinner's prayer, whatever it is, I am just a, an open and willing vessel. You know what my folks have said many times when they started TBN? They were probably the least likely person or people to start a TV network. They weren't talented, they couldn't sing, they didn't pastor a church, they had no money, but God used them anyway. Because why? Because very simply, they said yes to the Lord when he said, do you want to start a TV net? They were, they just said yes, and they were obedient. And that's what God wants. He doesn't want talent. He doesn't want money. He wants obedience, and that's the bottom line. Okay, we'll be back for our final segment with Paul Crouch Jr. in just a moment. <laughs> back with Paul Crouch Jr. And Paul, I've noticed recently that you guys are doing a lot more live broadcasts, a lot more news type guests than you had in the old days. Uh, has that been a conscious decision you've made to be more current with news and affairs? Yeah, a little bit. Again, every generation has their own style and wants and wishes and ways that they want to do things. And I, I enjoy having guests. Yes, I want to tell our viewers about TBN and what we're doing and the new shows and the new TV stations and the Holy Land experience and different things, but but I, I, I like bringing new new eyeballs and new people to TBN, and I've had a, a, a just a really great list of guests lately with Tim Conway and Deborah Norville and Tyler Perry was just on me, on with me recently, and 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 different guests that, that I just enjoy and let them talk about you know current events like you said, but let them share their faith because all of these people. Have a, have a faith of some sort, and, and it's been very, very interesting to kind of learn and, and share that with our audience. What do you think the philosophical foundations that formed Christian television back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and you're not only yours, but also Pat Robertson, mm -hmm. some of those assumptions are changing now. For instance, the Fairness Doctrine, when mm -hmm. that came and, and went, um, are, are you making changes, adjusting to kind of the climate that goes along? Yeah, and again, the FCC, we're still regulated very much by the Federal Communications Commission, and we, there are certain things we can and cannot do, especially when it comes to political races, and we're, we're going to keep our nose clean on all fronts as far as things like that, but Christian television was founded by preachers, pretty much. You know, Pat, my father, Jim Baker, Lester Summerall, the roots of Christian broadcasting is actually pretty small. That's why in the early days, and even in the early days of TBN, and still today, you see a lot of preaching shows, pulpits and choirs and that kind of thing. 
we're starting to change that dynamic a little bit and we are going to more issues driven programming like I said some of our greatest ratings are movies documentaries uh, proving our faith through science that kind of thing we have two documentaries that we've just secured recently called The Privileged Planet and Unlocking the Mysteries of Life that by the end of these things you have to have more faith to believe in evolution than you do have in intelligent design. I mean truly and, I, and I'm a very analytical person that way. So that's kind of what we're, what we're trying to do. We're trying to broaden the programming. We've got a kids block. We have a youth block of programming. We have movies. We have traditional Sunday service type things mainly on Sunday mornings and afternoons. So variety is, is the spice of life and, and TBN's no different. Have you ever thought about the idea um, that this generation has been trained to recognize commercials as, as a free, sort of a neutral zone? When they see a commercial, they think, okay, it's safe. When there's no commercials, they might think that there's proselytizing, whether it's an, you know, an infomercial for mm -hmm. a spaghetti, a pasta maker or whatever. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about that notion uh, as the times are changing? Of course, and again, how Christian television is funded is really the foundation and what my dad and and we didn't just he didn't come up with this it's stuff that Pat Robertson kind of pioneered with the telethons but my dad really feels that if we were to ever sell out and start doing commercials with you know I mean even good products you know I mean again Chick-fil-a Chick-fil-a or, or family Christian bookstores or something like that it'd be likening to going to your local church and having a Home Depot sign on the pulpit <laughs> in front of the pastor. Built by Home Depot. Built by Home Depot and behind the choir having squares, you know, like NASCAR, where you could put different symbols up there and sell it out to sponsors. That was, it would absolutely be, in his mind, doing the exact same thing, to sell out to commercialism like that on Christian broadcasting. So it's a generational thing. You're right. My kids have been uh, marketed out, out the wazoo. That's all they've seen for their whole life is logos on shirts and the internet and banner ads and this and that. So they're kind of numb to it and they're used to it. But my father's generation, it's, it's a whole different mindset. So you have to respect and honor mm -hmm. the foundation and what created TBN. But we have, like I said, I have my own ideas for things in the future and, and we're going to look at everything. Will there ever be a news broadcast on TBN? Well, Honestly, the 700 Club, we're partnered with Pat Robertson and Gordon Robertson, who's a good friend of mine. And the 700 Club is probably the closest thing to a news program on a daily basis. And then they produce uh, Christian World News, which we air on weekends. So the cost for us as a network to crank up and get news crews around the country and subscribe to Reuters and put it together, Probably, I, I would honestly much rather just work with CBN and, and, and let them kind of continue what they're already doing because they've got the foundation for that in place. But we will do more and more current events type programs, no doubt. What do you think a viewer tuning in 10 years from now might be surprised uh, at the changes and things that are happening at well, your network? What I hope to find is when is that our programming is so relevant and so current and so right on that when the next 9-11 happens, and trust me folks, it's going to happen. There is going to be disasters. There's going to be hurricanes. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be things that happen in this world. This is a, an imperfect planet that we're living on. That the next time that happens, that the first station they turn to will be TBN because they need answers, they need prayer, they want to know what's going on. That it's not CNN and Fox and the, the, the three-letter networks that, that are turned to, but it'll be TBN they turn to because not only will we cover whatever event it is, but right at the end, we know as Christians, we've got the answers. Hmm. Now, television evangelists are accused of living ostentatious lifestyles. You've always struck me as being a pretty normal guy. You, you don't seem to be living in a castle or no, driving not a Ferrari. Yet, not yet. Is that something that you've constantly cultivated or, or consciously cultivated, or is that just who you are? It's just really who I am. Uh, again, I am aware of people's perception. I, I am not 
you know, the three-peat suit kind of guy. I, I, I don't, you know, like you said, have a Ferrari. I, it's, just, it's just not my nature. I'm not against success, and I think that's what people, the world wants to brand is that, again, it's all about the money. It's all about the money. Oh, how many, he who dies with the most toys wins, that kind of thing. And there's a jealousy aspect to it. Have televangelists made mistakes? Have they gone over the top? Absolutely. My folks are the first ones to admit they've made mistakes. But again, you can't brand everybody by what you see one, it's the old bad apple, you know, thing. And, and like I said, I've seen what my folks stand for. I see what motivates them. And it's not the cars, it's not the bling, it's not the houses. It's affecting and changing people's lives. Because like we said, the first thing, first question was, we could be sitting around as billionaires right now and it's not going to happen. It will never happen. But even now, you could spend your day playing golf. What, what motivates you to get up in the morning and to make these changes and to stay in this process? Because anything we do, I think, should have an eternal purpose. And, and it's the old laying up treasures in heaven versus here on earth. And, you know, you, you have to take some time off. You can't burn yourself out. I've actually seen, if my folks have made a mistake, I think they have actually gone too hard too fast. Dad treated TBN almost like a sprint instead of a marathon. And I've seen that affect his health and I've seen that affect, uh, you know, the, the, the sunset years of his life and he's tired and he's worn out. And he, I wish he had and would take more time off and more vacation. So I'm, I'm learning for that, learning from that, but I want my life to count for something and, and working in the ministry to me is the most important thing I could do. Well, thank you, Paul Crest Jr. for being our guest. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on the Bully Pulpit Show where guests get to speak their mind. Join us next time for